Hello, hello. We have one fan. It is Nick. And Nick is a very good looking young man. He listens to his parents occasionally. And he's a big fan of uh, Spider Man and Superman and Tax Man. Tax Man is better than Spider Man or Superman because he saves people lots of money and pretends to like them. So we want to welcome Nick to this show. He also, Nick likes the Hulk, but we're not sure which Hulk it is. We think it's the Avenger Hulk and not Hulk Hogan. But Nick, if you let us know, maybe next week we'll have Batman or Taxman or who knows what man or Catwoman, any superhero you like. We got them all. So, oh, oh, and by the way, this presentation entitled Estate Planning for the Business Owner will not qualify for continuing education credit. And like most of Mr. Gassman's presentations is really not very good. So if you had something else you wanted to do, like buy a nice gift for your spouse or significant other, or maybe buy gifts for both your spouse and your significant other. Woo! Does that go over your head, Nick? Anyway, here we go. Enjoy the show. And sorry, it's not better. Welcome to Estate Planning for the Business Owner, part two. That's from 11 to noon. Then from noon to one, and it's not going to go that long, I'm sorry, we're going to talk about more business success strategies. So I welcome your questions. You can go to the question box. You can, Nick, if you're watching and you want to ask a question of Dummy McPuppet, just click on the little triangle and then type your question out. The three free Excel spreadsheets, a lot of people just send us an email with the word spreadsheet and we will send you the updated uh, spreadsheet, which is based on $12,060,000, which is the estate tax exemption amount. You can see a lot of our webinars on YouTube. This webinar will be posted on YouTube. If you search Gassman YouTube, the, the first row across is the 11 o'clock Saturday series. And then the next row is charitable. And then the third row is who knows what else. Okay. Onward, let's just mention next week, Jerry Hash, the amazing professor Jerry Hash, who is both a math maven with a master's degree in mathematics and a tax law professor and a state tax law professor and the chairman of the Notre Dame Tax Institute will join me to talk about the mathematics of estate planning. It is not as good as Donald Duck in mathematics land, which you can also see on YouTube. In fact, you should probably switch to that right now, but it's pretty darn good. And so our Saturday series uh, will continue whether you want it to or not. And I just pulled this and I hope I have permission from my friends at Steve Weinberg's newsletter, which is an incredible program. If you don't subscribe to it, go there immediately and sign up for the free trial because it's really good. The long-term applicable for a federal rate has just nudged up. This is big news. Effective for February, it's going up from 1.9% to 1.91%. So that really is what, about a 5% increase? What is 0.1? divided by, what is one divided by 191? That's a, almost a 1% increase in the long-term applicable federal rate. Midterm, thank God I don't have to take midterms anymore. It's at 1.4%. Short-term under three years, 0.59%. So you could take your $10 million municipal bond fund, Nick's father, and loan it to a trust for Nick. So you move that municipal bond fund, which is earning 1.5%, $10 million. You loan it to the trust for Nick. You charge the trust for Nick 0.59%. And the delta, which is ready when you are, is about 1.5% of $10 million. What's that? $150,000 a year. 
that Nick can receive to buy Spider-Man costumes, Batman costumes, Superman costumes, and the whole nine yards. So now, why do we use the semi-annual applicable federal rate when these are annualized loans? The answer is, I don't remember, but that's what you do. There is an article called Interesting Interest that explains that. And I think you can Google Interesting Interest, hash, H-E-S-C-H, and that article will come up. Page 18, my talk to first year surgeons, save your money for when you need it. Don't spend it earlier than you need it. Pay your debt down and live conservatively. Those are things that my most successful clients do and that my not quite as successful clients don't always do. So have goals. If you wanna succeed in having a business and protecting the business and propagating the business and passing the business without significant estate tax, have some goal. Are you ready for a catastrophic event? When somebody trips and falls or gets hit by a car, loses the ability to use an arm or a leg or worse, can your business survive that? What would happen? If your business does quadruple in value, like we hope it will, are you prepared for the estate tax issue? Are you protected from your present spouse or future spouses? Are you protected for your children? Are you protected from your children? So we have to have goals. And the first goal, I think, for many people is to recognize the risks. Because entrepreneurs are great at, oh, I got an idea. I can see the upside. Let's go do it. Thank heaven they didn't think about the downside or they wouldn't have done it. But now you're a big ship in the water. And you're a little boat in the water doesn't get shot at. A big ship in the water get shot at. So what's the process and where are you in the process? Many very successful large clients come to me, they don't have an earthly clue what their assets are, how things are titled, how things are taxed. They don't really have advisors or they don't listen to their advisors. They don't really understand what they have, so they can't even have goals to get to. Whereas other clients come to us very well organized, very well educated, but they're just missing a few key pieces of advice. They're following conventional practices, but not necessarily practical practices, or there's just no creativity in their plan. So the team of advisors is the safest thing. And I tell the young surgeons, when you meet an advisor who's an accountant, and can also provide you with financial advice, and also can handle life insurance, and also didn't really go to law school, but knows a lot about law. And this accountant can set up your company for you. And this accountant should be avoided at all costs. It's too complicated to know much more than just accounting if you're an accountant or to know much more than just law if you're a lawyer, or to know much more about investments and how taxes and investments and insurances work if you're an advisor. So beware that advisor who knows everything, because often that's the advisor who means well and knows the least. The second thing is, for all my armor and all my tricks of the trade and all my silver bullets, if you don't run your business responsibly, you are living in a glass house. And just think about someone who lives in a glass house and only takes one brick to destroy a glass house. So please get with a, a risk advisor Ask your insurance agency or carrier to put you with a risk advisor who could come to your business and walk around and say, well, someone could trip and fall there. That machine could take someone's arm off. You don't have the right posters for your employees. 
and think about the risk and make sure you have plenty of liability insurance for your activities. And if you things, just double check once a year, once every other year. You should have somebody who's in charge of your risk management and it should be somebody who's not fearless. So remember a CPA, Certified Public Accounting, they go through a lot of testing and they have to take a lot of continuing education. An enrolled agent, just not so much. It's possible that an enrolled agent can be well qualified, but not so common. So you want to have really good advisors. And the one missing from a lot of businesses is the actuary. And why would you need an actuary for your business planning? And the reason is the pension plan laws, and especially the very best planning opportunities, are only understandable by really, really smart tax lawyers who don't communicate very well usually, and actuaries who have really good software. And I, I was talking to one of the payroll services, I won't mention the name, but they're one of the five largest payroll services in the United States. They're one of the top five providers of pension plans in the United States, and they do not offer their clients defined benefit or cash value pension plans. So my client could have been putting $300,000 a year into a pension plan for the last five years, has only been putting 40,000 a year in because his CPA didn't really realize that those plans had not been evaluated and thought that there would be a tremendous cost of employees to put the client on the plan. And the answer was not so much. And here's an example. You have owner one makes 275,000 a year, owner two, 275 a year, and they have employees, four of them, who make 30,000 a year. And here's the ages of these employees. Well, owner one and owner two at 54 and 49 can put 325,000 a year into a cash balance plan. They'd have to put 3,000 a year for the employees. At the same time, they do what's called a cross-tested 401k. They put $43,000 for themselves, nothing for employees there, but then a safe harbor contribution of $3,600 for employees, end of story. Owners, $368,000 tax deductible. Employees, $10,284, and they're happy to have it. And it used to be you had to have this plan in place by December 31st, no more, just by the due date of your corporate return. So get at that actuary. And uh, even if you're only 40 years old, you could put $87,000 a year into a defined benefit plan. Here's the form to fend out, fill out on page 28. Most of the good pension actuaries will not charge you to fill this out. Well, I know I've shown it before, and I know you know that even a piece of trash on a Target parking lot can cost $4.6 million if it turns out to be a needle. And someone who has a building collapse on them could receive $148 million from you. So uh, let's be careful out there from a creditor protection standpoint. And I know this is not the right time in the economy to be talking about creditor protection, but it will be, it does happen. And lawyers and accountants, we know that our clients get overconfident and take a lot of debt on, and then they have to go bankrupt. And it's, it's not a pleasant thing, especially with the vehicles. Please don't have cars and trucks in your, with your golden goose. You put these into separate entities. The separate entities hire the drivers. They are independent contractors to your business. Just like the Canes Furniture v. Miranda case, where Dr. Miranda was killed, rear-ended by an allegedly drunk Canes Furniture installer. The Canes Furniture had had good advice, and that truck and that installer were independent contractors owned by an affiliated entity. So the judgment did not penetrate the Keynes Furniture Company. So don't have someone tell you you can't plan because you can plan 
and you should plan. A lot of clients put real estate in S corporations. Stop that right now. <laughs> There's a lot of disadvantages to putting real estate in S corporations. I'm not gonna go into it. I'm just gonna point it out. If you've recently put real estate in an S corporation, consider converting it to a partnership, but it may be too late. So get to know the different kinds of entities. The regular corporation, which we call an Inc. or a Corp., which can make an S election or be a C corporation or maybe a professional company. The LLC, which can be taxed as disregarded if it only has one member, or it will be taxed as a partnership if it has multiple members, or as a C corporation or an S corporation if it elects to be taxed that way. There's times to use each of these alternatives. Don't pick an alternative by accident. And then there's the general partnership where each partner is responsible for the liabilities of the partnership. Oops, that would be problematic unless you have a limited liability partnership, which will shield the liability. But then in mo many states, the limited liability partnership interests will not be protected from charging order protection. Uh, uh, so you have to be careful. And that was such an inartful sentence about charging order protection. I'm not even going to try to fix it. But get to know these things and help our clients to understand them. S corporations have long been er uh, used to avoid employment taxes. If I have a C corporation, I have to take out every dollar to zero out taxable income at the end of the year. And I have to hope that that qualifies as reasonable compensation to me. And then I pay employment taxes. But if I have an S corporation, I can let those dividends come out to me. They're not subject to employment taxes. Now, every year or two years or four years for the past 30 years, I've heard them say, oh, you're going to end up paying employment taxes on your S corp income. Congress is going to act. This is too good to be true. And it did almost happen last year, but it hasn't happened yet. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, choose your entities carefully. Now, what can own an S corporation? A person can, an irrevocable trust that's properly drafted can, a grant or retained annuity trust can, a disregarded LLC can, but you have to be really careful to make sure it's disregarded. A 501c3 charity can own S corporation stock, but will have to pay income tax on the income. A trust taxed at your children's brackets can own S corporation stock and possibly qualify for the section 199A deduction. So if I have a company that makes widgets, and I'm in the 37% bracket, and I don't qualify for the section 199A deduction because my income is too high, I can set up a trust for my spouse and children and have it considered to be owned by one of my children for income tax purposes. And that, that's under Internal Revenue Code section 678, and that's called a brilliant name that we assign to it, it's a 678 trust. No, they don't cost $678. They cost more than that, but it's a lot less than $6,780. It's under code section 678. And if you Google IRC section 678, you can read it for yourself. The trust that allows certain powers to a child or a grandchild will be considered as owned by the child or grandchild even though it may benefit your spouse or others if it's properly drafted. And then that grandchild is in a lower tax bracket. And if they're under about 170,000 of taxable income, they get that 20% deduction under section 199A. So pretty cool stuff, huh? All right, a little bit about creditor protection. And I think 
a lot of advisors just don't think about this or they think it's too much of a hassle. Here's John and he owns the widget business and he did set up an irrevocable trust for his family and it's owned 3% by the family LLC. John owns 97%. The family LLC has is owned one half of 1% voting by an irrevocable trust for his family. He doesn't really like his family, but he does like his creditor protection. So by having this set up, if somebody gets a judgment against John, depending upon state law that applies, they may only be able to get what's called a charging order. It has nothing to do with those, those uh, canisters that you make soda law, water with. Those are, those are charging canisters. This is charging orders. It's an order from the court. John, you owe this creditor all this money. You owe 97% of the LLC. If you ever take money out of the LLC, you got to pay the creditor. John says, okay, well, do I have to take money out of the LLC? And the judge says, no, I can't force you to do that because of the charging order statute. John says, okay, Mr. Creditor, I'm never taking anything out of the LLC. I'm going to live on my paycheck, which is creditor proof in the state where I live. And you're never going to get anything unless you settle for five cents on the dollar. But the creditor says, okay, I don't care. I'm just going to come get your widget factory. Your widget factory is not protected, not the operating widget business. The factory is protected under the LLC there, but the widget business is not protected. So what do we do? Well, John could take all the money out of the widget business, but that could cause income tax. John could loan money to the widget business, but then it would have more money to lose to creditors. So John calls his CPA and says, how much can I take out of the widget business company without triggering tax? And the CPA says 300,000. John takes out the 300,000. John says, how much money can the company owe me without triggering income tax? The accountant says nothing. You're stuck. The company cannot owe you money. What does John do? John calls his advisor who listened to this Saturday presentation against their will, and they managed to stay awake until now. Can John loan 800? Can John have the widget business owe the family LLC $800,000? Well, no, because that would be the same as John being owed and that would cause income tax. So John sets up Widget Holdings LLC. It's an S corporation. It owns 100% of the widget business company. The widget business company elects to be treated as a qualified subchapter S subsidiary. And it can owe as much as it wants to Widget Holdings LLC. Then Widget Holdings LLC can be partly owned by the irrevocable trust. So then when somebody gets hurt by a widget, and sues widget business. They're not going to get paid until after widget holdings gets paid and the family LLC gets paid. So that would be the new parent F reorganization. Here's another example. Medical practice owns the building, I mean, I'm sorry, owns the practice operations and the equipment and the real estate. That is not good. So we set up a new parent company. The medical practice company is owned by the new parent company. It gets to keep its tax identification number and its name. Nobody really knows. You have to tell Medicare and your insurance company. But now the medical practice can transfer the equipment and the real estate to separate brother-sister companies. And the separate brother-sister companies can allow the medical practice to use these assets but now when somebody sues the medical practice, they're not going to get the equipment easily. They're not going to get the real estate easily. And we've separated these without triggering income tax. That's the new parent F is in Frank reorganization. And the accounts receivable. Well, you could sell the accounts receivable to a accounts receivable factoring company owned by the same parent company. 
and we call that the elope system, extended letter of protection system. So then your family limited partnership loans money to the accounts receivable factoring company at 12% interest. So now the S Corp is getting a deduction for paying 12% interest to a partnership for the children, which may be taxed at the children's level. And then the creditor can't reach the accounts receivable because the partnership for the children has a lien on them and they are outside of the medical practice. So that would be examples of this elope system and the new parent F reorganization. And I think the rest of this talk, I'm going to give you mostly examples. I'll talk a little bit about law and tax law, but I really want to talk about these examples. So here's somebody who loves animals and loves ranching and loves not being in debt. So all of that was going on in one company. Uh-oh, what's wrong with that picture? Your friends are renting their horse stalls from you. Your Friends are out there riding their horses with their children. Somebody gets hurt, they're not gonna be your friends anymore. But in any event, let's owe money, this LLC which owns the real estate, to a Nevada LLC that could be under a creditor protection trust. Just put in a typical note and mortgage. And then let's lease the property on one lease, to a master leasing company, the master leasing company enters into a triple net lease, and now the master leasing company rents out the, the animal stalls, hires the trainer, does the business. Now somebody gets hurt, they're gonna take the improvements owned by the leasing, the master leasing company, they're gonna take the hay and the shovels and the liability insurance limits, which should be significant, but they're not going to have a good shot at this company because under the Florida law, and this is for most states, if you have a triple net lease and the tenant is completely responsible for everything, then the landlord is not responsible when somebody gets hurt on that property. But let's say that they can find the landlord entity liable. Well, now they're only going to get the equity in the property because of the loan to the LLC. So this would be a common way of getting protection. Now, I'll mention this because we do get clients who come in and they say, well, I've got property in the Bahamas or I've got property in the Caymans or I have property in Spain or Portugal and I transfer it to an LLC. Yes, it takes the equivalent of an act of Congress in those countries to transfer property to an LLC, including a two to 3% transfer tax can be considerable, but it usually is not expensive to put a lien against the property. So Joe Bahama paid a million dollars to a trust for his children, and then he gives the, the uh, he, actually he agrees to pay a million dollars to an LLC owned 10% by a trust for his children. Then he gives the property in the Bahamas as collateral for the loan. Then the world hits the fan. He sells the property. The first dollars from the sale go to the LLC and he has charging order protection. So a creditor looks at this and the property in the Bahamas is no longer easy prey. Otherwise, if he just owns a million dollar property in the Bahamas, the plaintiff lawyer is not gonna settle a case as low as they otherwise would. But it's, so that's, that's another uh, idea. I showed this one last week, but it's a client who has uh, rental properties in Florida and New Mexico and personal properties in Florida and New Mexico, and fortunately, an estate tax problem. So from the estate tax standpoint, we establish an irrevocable trust value these properties at about seven and a half million, transfer them to LLCs. We sell 99% non-voting member interests in the LLCs to the trust in exchange for a 5 million seven note, which will now have to be a 1.91% interest. 
for 20 years. That's about 110,000 a year. Now these properties worth seven and a half million, they double in value to 15 million in 10 or 20 years, but the client is still only owed a 5 million seven note. So we've frozen those values. Now we've also at least got the New Mexico properties out of the client's name into an LLC. So if there's a horrific accident in New Mexico, she doesn't lose the Florida properties. But we could do better. Uh, we could, oh, I thought I had a slide here. I'm sorry, I don't. But the, the slide I would have showed you is that the New Mexico real estate LLC there could be a holding LLC. And then the, the New Mexico properties could be put into separate LLCs, maybe one for each property or two properties per LLC. And then they can owe notes, those LLCs can owe notes to the holding company of about 80% of the value of the properties. So if somebody gets hurt, the creditor can't, will hopefully not be able to reach more than the equity in each LLC. So we've done the, the creditor protection planning in advance. And then of course we would put the Florida home and the New Mexico homes into qualified personal residence trusts if we want to uh, protect those as well. There's another one I did uh, last week. And uh, let me see where, I think I had a slide mix up here. This is a family with a C corporation. I'm encouraging them, encouraging them to, to convert to, to, to S, but they are C right now. The value of the company, 18 million. These set up trusts for our children and put 10% in each trust. The children work in the business. They're wonderful. We want to avoid the state tax and give them a piece of the action. Okay, that's great. What is 10% worth? Well, what's 20% worth? Well, we're going to take a one-third discount because we're giving those trusts non-voting member interests. So it's a two million four gift. It's a gift from spouse one, whose exemption goes down from twelve million sixty to uh, what nine million six sixty. And I'm never so trusting of the sons. Parents are my clients. So I'm gonna do these as slats. What is that, Slousel, spousal, slousal? Wow, spousal limited access trusts. One for, spouse one forms them, spouse two is the trustee, spouse two can get benefits from those trusts, spouse two can redirect how the trusts go be among the, the descendants when spouse two dies. What happens? Son one and son two and they're, Spouses are respectful of mom. So what's the result here? If mom needs money, she can get it out. If she doesn't need money, she leaves it in. On mom's death, it's all one is for son one, one is for son two. And we put in a buy-sell agreement between the two slats. So if one son dies, the other trust buys out son one, and then son one's uh, trust is held for son one's children. What are the numbers? Well, if the company sells for 50 million in 20 years, spouse one and spouse two get four, get 50 million. They pay I get 40 million for their 90%. They pay 10 million in taxes. They pay all the taxes because of the way the slats work. And they end up with 30 million. The kids end up with 10 million. That's not bad for a 2 million four gift. On the other hand, if this company sells for 100 million, mom and dad end up with 60 million. The kids end up with 20 million. Not bad from mom and dad's standpoint, but big challenge for the children. So how did I, how did I propose that we do this? And I'm sure you're aware of how what I proposed. I proposed an installment sale. So instead of giving son one and son two 20%, let's sell them 50% non-voting in exchange for notes 
And then if things don't go well, the, the notes owed back to the clients are enough for them to live on. And the clients still have half the business. So let's see how that works. We'll go to slide 87. 50% of 18 million is $9 million. Take a one third discount. The notes are gonna be $6 million, or actually the sale's gonna be 6 million. I'm gonna say that 10% of the transfer is a gift and 90% is a note. So dad's gonna use uh, six million, uh, dad's gonna use a million two of his exemption instead of two million four. And he's gonna be owed 10 million eight. Now what happens? If things go badly, dad gets everything because the company will be worth less than 10 million eight. But look, look at this, $50 million sale, mom and dad get 25 million, plus they get 10 million eight on the notes, they pay 10 million of taxes on the, 25, on the 50 million sale, they net 25 million, the children now have 14 million. So mom and dad used a million two less of their exemption and the children ended up with an extra four million two. What if the company sells for a hundred million? Well, mom and dad get fifty million plus the ten million eight in notes. They pay twenty million in taxes. They net forty million. The children get fifty million minus the ten eight in notes. They net thirty nine million. So the children come out twenty one million ahead here and Uncle Sam comes out behind. So that would be why it would be easier just to do the 10% each gifts, but much more effective to do the installment sale. And because these trusts are disregarded for income tax purposes, there's no income tax triggered by the sale and no income tax triggered when these slats pay off mom and dad or pay interest. And if the C corporation makes an S election, which is perfectly fine, then mom and dad start paying all the income tax instead of the C corp paying the tax and the children and grandchildren come out even further ahead. Now, this is one you can adapt. Those of you who are uh, practitioners and most of you are, um, plus Nick who wishes I was Batman. I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, here you have one spouse owning a few assets, the other spouse owning a few assets. And for estate tax avoidance, you simply set up one holding company for the husband's assets, one holding company for the wife's assets, and a separate slat by one spouse, a separate trust for descendants by the other spouse, and an installment sale. And a lot of people say, how do you decide what to put under the sale? And the answer is easy. Everything goes under the sale because we want to freeze everything that can grow. We want to discount everything that lit, that exists. So just about everything goes under the sale. Clients come to me and they've done it extraordinarily well with certain assets, but why not everything? And one of the reasons is that the client's advisors are just not comfortable doing sales of S corporations with uh, with grats and with installment. Now here is a tax and creditor protection plan that I'm uh, pleased to explain to you. Uh, this particular client has businesses happening, um, successful entrepreneur, and also has invest, passive investment assets and would like to avoid estate tax and initially start by putting the investment assets into a trust that can benefit his descendants and his parents and would not be subject to estate tax in his estate. But if it ever hit the fan, he'd like to be able to be added 
into the plan, you know, just in case. So we can set up an I, a Cook Islands Trust. Remember Captain Cook? He discovered something, I don't remember what, and the Cook Islands are named after him. The Cook Islands are an independent country. They're a dependent ship of New Zealand. They're a six hour flight north of New Zealand. I haven't been there yet, but I hope to go to review your trust agreement. And creditors don't hope to go there to review your trust agreement because it's a long, expensive trip. So that irrevocable trust receives a gift of some money, which may be held in a Cook Islands bank account and purchases a 99% interest in an LLC in exchange for a note. So 20 million goes in there and the note is 13 million. So we've gotten 7 million out of the estate plus future growth. The note's only at 1.91% interest. But we don't want to make the note very easy to, for creditors to reach. So the note is owed to an irrevocable trust. And the irrevocable trust may be a domestic trust, may be a foreign trust, may own a Nevis LLC. The Nevis LLC may own the businesses. The Nevis LLC may check a box under Form 8832 to be disregarded for income tax purposes, but you do have to notify the federal government of the existence of the LLC and of everything that this trust does and owns directly or indirectly to avoid very large um, penalties. So, oh, here's the page for the uh, person with the New Mexico property, showing you the separate LLCs which owe money to the parent LLC for uh, these and why do we put the parent LLCs in Wyoming? Because Wyoming has good charging order protection, good tenancy by the entireties uh, law, and does not disclose ownership or managers on its website. So there's confidentiality there. Now the Iowa Supreme Court a couple years ago ruled that if you set up an Iowa LLC and you live in another state and your creditors in that other state, it's Iowa law that applies to get you Iowa charging order protection. So if the Iowa Supreme Court was correct, and I think there's at least a 50-50 chance that they were, if you live in a state that doesn't have tenancy by the entireties or charging order protection, for example, if you live in California or Colorado, then you might want to set up a Wyoming, Delaware, or Florida LLC and use that and title it as tenants by the entireties. Just got a phone call and I'll have to say, can I call you later? All right. Now, let's talk about the buy-sell agreement. We see a lot fewer buy-sell agreements than we wish clients had. It is not simple to establish a buy-sell agreement that's well-written, but it's very essential that you have an agreement, even in a family entity, as to what's gonna happen if somebody dies or becomes disabled, or worse yet, becomes a jerk. Because even the nicest people with blood sugar issues, or mental illness or medication issues could become a jerk. So you want to have a well thought out buy sell agreement. And so often what we see is that the company buys the life insurance and if somebody dies, they're gonna be bought out. But let's look at this, they're, they're driving for the company and they get in a horrendous accident. So there's a huge lawsuit against the company and it's the company that receives the life insurance. It's not a good idea. Or here's the other example. Bob and Joe, best friends, great partners. Bob dies, Joe gets the life insurance proceeds. 
Joe's getting sued for divorce. Joe has a gambling problem. Joe has a drug problem. Joe thinks that's, that Bob ripped off the business. Joe gets his insurance proceeds and does not give them to Bob's family. So what do you do? I prefer, so the first one I talked about is the entity redemption agreement. I don't like that one because it puts the entity, it puts the life insurance at risk. The second one is the cross purchase agreement. I don't like that because it puts the the survivor at the risk of the, I mean the uh, the deceased person's family at the risk of the survivor. So what we like is a trustee purchase agreement. A lot of times what we'll do for tax purposes, and there's a private letter ruling that tells you how to do this. Um, it's private letter ruling 2007, 47002. So you can just Google private letter ruling 2007, 47002. And what you have here is you have the operating company own 50-50. And then the shareholders set up another LLC that's taxed as a partnership. Because in order to transfer real estate without, I mean, in order to transfer life insurance that's already existing without making it taxable as income on death, it has to go to a partner in a partnership. So shareholder A and shareholder B can either form an LLC or they should form an LLC. And maybe that LLC also owns a desk and it leases the desk to the operating company. It gets a little bit of income. Now it's a partnership. And just to make sure that A and B are partners, they go to their stockbroker and they each invest $5,000 in a publicly traded partnership. So now they are partners in a partnership. Entity owns the life insurance and agrees that on death, the entity will be managed by the surviving shareholder and the spouse of the deceased shareholder or a trusted individual. And then they're required to use those proceeds only to satisfy the buy-sell agreement on behalf of the surviving shareholder. So it's the best of all worlds. I do encourage you, pick up your buy-sell agreements. You're, this is gonna surprise you. I know this is gonna surprise you. Read them. When a lawyer provides an agreement for you, the best advice the lawyer can give you is read what I sent you. Read the paragraph about what happens when I die and what happens if there's not enough life insurance. Read the paragraph about what happens if I become disabled or I become a jerk. How do you get me out of there and what do you have to pay me? Who is the tiebreaker? See, when you have a 50-50 situation, and this often happens in my estate planning conversations, I say, oh, okay, your children get along well? You want them to be co-trustees? Well, they usually get along. Okay, what's going on? Well, one of them's married to a person who's a real control person and never really decides. And okay, well, then this 50-50 idea is not such a good one. In fact, if you really want to be a stinker in your 50-50, you'll just never agree to anything and drag it out. So that's where you want to have the tiebreaker. Because if there's a tiebreaker, then the 50-50 stinker doesn't really have motivation to be a jerk because they know the tiebreaker is gonna break the tie. So the tiebreaker could be your CPA, could be your lawyer, could be your hairdresser, could be a, a law firm, could be your Uncle Floyd. I, di I just did one where the client says, well, flip a coin. And I said, no, that's not good because if you flip a coin, then somebody who's doing something really stupid has a 50% chance of making their brother or sister do something really stupid. So uh, a little bit of wisdom and not so much wit on uh, dealing with partners. I think there's a joke, a, a, a partner go, has, has a partner and he goes to the bank and he's standing in line to make a deposit as, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I left the safe open. 
let me, I, I got to go back and, oh, never mind, I'm good. So the teller goes, you know, what's going on? First, you were concerned that you left the safe open and then you weren't so concerned. He goes, well, yeah, I looked back in the line and my partner was back there in the line. So he's not going to steal from the safe while I'm gone. So, you know, maybe it's not such a good joke or I didn't tell it so well. Here's the reminder on the Section 199A income tax rules. These came out in 2017. We got all excited about them. And some clients did set up these 678 trusts or trusts for grandchildren to avoid income tax, but then it looked like these rules were on their way out last year. And we all just got so involved with COVID and PPP and uh, all EIDL and tax, state tax law changes. We just haven't talked about it enough. It is still out there where Dr. Jones has too much income to take the 199A deduction. But if she sets up a practice management company and pays the normal going rate to the practice management company, and the practice management company is owned by trust for her children, and the medical practice can be owned by trust for her grandchildren, you could save significant income taxes and at the same time, these trusts can avoid state tax. So don't give up on Section 199A planning and income tax planning. It is uh, still out there, and there are tricks of the trade. We'll also mention that there is one reason to have an IRA, even if you don't need one and don't want one, and that is that it is possible for an IRA to own a business. So, you know, we do have clients who have to stay judgment proof because of judgments against them. And we are in Florida, which like most states does not allow a creditor to touch an IRA. And an IRA can own a business that it starts from inception. So the IRA becomes a 401k, and then the 401k owns the business. And uh, Brandon Ketron and I have written about this, and we have represented clients who have done it. And it makes me queasy from an income tax standpoint, because if you do anything wrong, it could disqualify the, IR, the 401k. But it is a way, it is a lifeboat, way to support a family running an active business when all you have is an IRA. So what's more important than what I've said in the last 53 minutes, also known to many of you as 1.4 billable hours, is what the follow-up is. Both for me as a business owner for you as a business owner in your business or practice, or for you as an advisor, why is it that certain advisors have clients that do the things that they recommend and certain advisors just don't? You know, well, Wally, you could save money with a 199A 678 trust, but if you get audited, the IRS may not like it and it costs money to set up, and you'll need a separate tax return. I, I don't think I would. Well, Charlie, a 678 trust would probably save your family about $42,000 a year of income tax. Probably cost about $10,000 to set up, but that's tax deductible. IRS doesn't like it, but it's all statutory. What do you think? That's like a different way to explain it. And by the way, I did one myself because I didn't want to be anyone's guinea pig. So the first one I did for myself and I'll be glad to let you see a, a copy of it. So what can you do in the next 30 days? Number one, call your insurance agent. He's lonely. He wants to talk to you about raising your limits of liability. 
Don't ever let an insurance agent tell you, well, Floyd, you only have $2 million of assets. You just need a $2 million umbrella. It doesn't work that way. If you get sued for $20 million and you have $2 million of assets, you better hope you have a $20 million umbrella. That's the way it works. And it's never a bad idea to take all your coverages to a separate, new, independent agency. Let them look at it and make suggestions. Go back to your agency and say, here's the suggestions of the independent agency. What do you recommend? Just make sure you're covered from an insurance standpoint. Life insurance, make sure you know who the owner and the beneficiary is of each policy. Have the life insurance agency run physicals. Use informal applications, as I've talked in the past. If you don't want the bureau to get all your results, if there's a blip on that EKG that you don't want the bureau to see, start off with an informal application. Get your will and trust signed. You know, a lot of wealthy people come to me and they send me the trust and it's not signed. And then they get irritated. I say, I got the trust, but it's not signed. Oh, I'm sure we signed it. Okay, well, what, what did you do with the copy? Not sure. Okay, call the law firm. Hey, do you have a signed copy of this? No, we sent it to Floyd. We sent him a couple of reminder letters. He emailed back and said he had signed it, but nobody knows where the copy is. Okay, well, it's a good thing Floyd's still living. Floyd, why don't you sign it right now? Get it witnessed so in case a bus hits you, you're set. And then we'll go ahead and improve it. So what you do in the next 30 days is very important. Uh, page one, Page 126, I have a family situation before and after planning, and I'll uh, go ahead and go over this with you in a few weeks as to how you avoid estate tax, regulators, creditors, trust litigation, governmental confiscation, community property, creditor issues, divorce, and homestead, all in one easy four page item. Thus ending my first presentation today. And now I'll answer some questions. Does this qualify for CPE? No, because it's not good enough. What about a CLU? No, it's not good enough. Okay, Florida statutes golden rule, Florida statute 22214 exempts personally owned, let's see, exempts personally owned cash value of life insurance and annuity. Yes, James, it does. And I share the joy that that uh, happens. Then uh, if I come to Florida, will you help me with my estate planning? Yep, glad to. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, Bring your lawyer from wherever you're from so she can make sure I comply with your state laws when I'm helping. Okay, is it wise to have a Roth five IRA in order to av avoid a five-year rule problem? I'm not sure what uh, Lewis is referring to there. Um, we can do a presentation because we wrote a book on IRA beneficiaries and trust planning. You get a you get a 10 year stretch on, an, on a Roth IRA that you leave on death to a family member or a well-drafted trust, but to a poorly drafted trust, you only get a five year stretch on a Roth IRA or on any IRA to, uh, to mention that. Okay, what software do we use for the, for the flow charts? We use Excel. Everything we do is in Excel except for the uh, estate view software, which I was gonna show today if I can find it, but I can't. So uh, the, the estate view software is separate, but Excel is what we, Excel draws circles, squares, adds up numbers, draws lines, curvy lines, straight lines, gives you colors all in Excel. And other people have told me there's better uh, products for illustration, but we're, we're an Excel shop and it would be hard to, for us to change and adapt to another uh, 
type of, sys of systems. So, concludes that part of the pro of the presentation today. Now we go to uh, part two, and that is uh, business success strategies. Now I had intended for this to be a half hour, and for those of you who wanted this to be an hour, it'll probably seem like an hour <laughs> anyway. But if you want me to do another 30 minutes sometime, just ask me, and that way you don't have to hurt my feelings by saying, nah, not so much. 60 minutes was enough. So repeating what I said in the last time we talked about business success, which I think was the first Saturday in January, Professor Drucker, again, you have to quit something before you do something else. And David Finkel, again, find that best 5% of your business and expand that best 5% and clobber everything else. Because it's that best 5%, that gold, that platinum, that you can duplicate, expand, and get rid of what David calls those shiny objects that keep uh, distracting you. All right. So, last time we talked about what are my behaviors that I can reduce or eliminate. And uh, one thing that somebody said to me uh, last night. I had a glass of wine. Marcia and I had a glass of wine with a friend. And she said, how much time do you waste during your workday or that's non-billable during your workday? And I said, well, today I had 1.3 non-billable hours. And she laughed and she said, how do you know that? And I said, because when I do anything that's not billable, I write down a time slip and I write down what it is so at the end of the week, I know how much time I spent doing things that are not billable. And I know how much time I spent doing billable things. And I know how much time I spent doing things that I get paid a fixed fee on. And, and the key there is the time that it takes me to write that down on my clipboard is really zero time because my subconscious mind does it. I just do it automatically. So when I start a new task, when somebody comes in and interrupts me and says, I got a question for Mrs. Jones. I say, hold on. I write down Mrs. Jones, 1, 11.22 a.m. And then when we're done with the conversation, if it's a minute, I don't do anything. If it's five minutes, I write down a one-tenth of a one percent, I mean, one-tenth of an hour time slip. At the end of a 10-hour day, I have 10 hours of time slips. And Kelly comes in and looks at my time slips three to four times a day. Is it, wait a minute, you're missing something. You're at noon and you don't have six hours in. What did you forget to write down? So if that may be my most valuable habit. If I have a second most valuable habit, it's that I do keep a daily to-do list and I list and I hand write it. It takes 10 to 12 minutes and I always get three or four good ideas and reminders when I write down Smith Trust. And then I think, oh my gosh, I could put the mother-in-law in there as a beneficiary and get them a stepped up basis when the mother-in-law dies. I hadn't thought of that. And then I write a little E with a circle next to Smith Trust, which means that's my reminder to send an email about that idea. And then I write down Jones Trust. I write down a little K with a circle. I've been getting to the Jones Trust for three days in a row. I'm gonna let Ken do it. I'm gonna take that imaginary monkey on my back and I'm gonna go over to Ken and I'm gonna let that monkey climb on Ken's back and it is the Jones Trust. And then when, Joan, when Ken comes back to me the next day and has a question about that trust, I'm not gonna take it back. I'm gonna help him, but I'm not gonna take the Jones Trust back. 
that monkey is on his back. I'm going to keep my distance, not because of COVID-19, but more because of the monkey. So with the COVID-19, the monkey on your back thing isn't as good as it was, but I guess you can imagine a spider monkey, and you should probably wear protective goggles in case that spider monkey jumps in your face. Was that a useful tangent? So what we're looking for here is habits and behaviors that will make you more productive. And my friend last night, Margaret, also pointed out that if you can just change your world by 1%, and you could do that just 1% a week for 50 weeks, then you're at 150% making very small changes. So here's another one for you. Who can you be assertive with to save time? For example, I, I tell uh, younger lawyers here, when you get somebody on the phone and they just won't stop talking, they just go on and on and on and on and on. If a person is used to being stopped. So what you can say is, I've got to make a call in five minutes. Just push that in. I've got to make a call in five minutes. And then at five minutes, just say, time for my call. And they will either stop or they won't stop. There's, they'll stop. But if they don't stop, then you simply say, gotta run, click. But think about that. that. That person who works with you in your office who just loves to tell you their problems and the drama of their life is more important than anything you're doing. Can you be assertive with them? Say, hey, Fred, I just I just took a time management course and the 10 minutes that we spend every day I need. So if you want to type me an email about how bad Wilma is, that's fine, but I can't do this anymore. You know, make a list of those people. They are your time wasters. The alternative is the person who says nothing useful and you don't have to really listen to them, but they need to talk. An assistant, sit down and listen to them while you do your other stuff and tell you if they said anything that means anything. So if you're going to committee meetings and the first 45 minutes of the committee meeting is small talk and you choose not to, not to use your camera and to have a responsible person take copious notes, that might be a good idea. Don't tell anyone that I uh, said that. So here's some things I've done since that Saturday, since two Saturdays ago. I used to use Dragon Speak, and I stopped about four years ago when I switched computers. I never got it back up. I went back to Dragon Speak uh, the day after I said that I would. Dragon Speak is saving me a lot of time. I'm not as good at it as I was, but I could say, I, I could say, hi, Mary, this is Alan. It's great to talk to you. It's been a long time. Thanks for sending me to your email. I have a couple of questions. The first one is, how old are you now? The second one is, what is your net worth? I could speak that fast. It's now all on the screen. I can send it to a secretary to clean it up and send, or I can clean it up myself and send faster than I type. So that's Dragon Speak. Also, if I don't want to record a telephone conversation because I don't want to ask permission, but I'd like to have a transcript of what was said, maybe I turn on the Dragon Speak. I haven't tried that because I usually take notes, but maybe I should put Dragon Speak on my second computer and just say, Floyd, I've got Dragon Speak going. And then I can erase what Dragon Speak said after, after I see it. 
Maybe that's, maybe that's a good strategy for you. The other strategy I mentioned was I bought a lot of $65 tape recorders for I think about 10 people in the office and when they see me, they bring their tape recorder or when I go to see them, I, I say, turn on your recorder and then I talk as fast as I want. And I don't have to worry about whether they took notes or not or go slow so they can take notes. Now, the second thing, and this is gonna save 10 minutes a day, whenever somebody in my office works on a client's chart, they email me the chart and in the RE line, it says Mary Hughes chart. So now when I need Mary Hughes' chart, I don't have to go into the directory, which takes two minutes and it's tedious. I just search my emails for Mary Hughes chart. And it may not be the latest one, but it probably is, it pops right up. Another thing that I do that I forgot to mention uh, last week is my printer is my reminder system. So throughout the day, when I get an email I need to answer or a letter I need to handle, or I see a document I need to work on, I just print it. And then at the end of the day, my assistant Riley staples everything on my printer and puts it in what's called the red folder and as she goes through it she sees things and she knows what some of those things are and she handles some of those things as she looks through it if it's really important she reminds me but otherwise when i the first thing i look at when i get on my treadmill the next morning is i go through that folder and all the things i printed the day before to remind myself of things to do and then I hand those papers to people who I delegate them to. So just use your printer as a reminder. And I have two printers. You see one of them there and the other one is, where's the other one? The other one's there. So one of those I can print to for reminders and the other I can print to for what I'm working on. And one of them is a color printer, which is a lot more expensive to print on than the black and white. So the price of the color printer was paid for by the black and white copies that I don't need color for. Because one thing I learned was when you buy black and white toner for a color copier, it's about five times as expensive as the black and white toner that goes in the other copier. And the other thing I learned was the copier guy who fixes our copiers said that our old Hewlett Packard copiers are much more inexpensive on toner than the new copiers that we can buy. So these little things where you improve your business 1% of a at, at a time can be very valuable. So when we're done, if you could print out page 146 on your black and white printer and fill out what your biggest time waster is, it's not a bad idea to walk around the office and ask people what they're doing. Marty Schweitzer taught me that. He was a really good CPA and friend. He died a decade ago or so. And he said, just walk around the office and say, hey, what are you doing? And you'll be surprised at how many times you'll find people doing things they shouldn't be doing that you didn't need for them to do. Just don't do that anymore. It's just a, a good idea. But talking to negative talkaholics is a big one. Another thing that we try to do is we try to convert phone calls to emails. Not because I don't like to talk to people, I do like to talk to people, but I also like to keep people's bills down and I like to make sure I got the right information and they got the right information. So clients who are in the habit of leaving me voicemails get an email back very promptly. Floyd, thanks for the voicemail. The answer is yes. Please let me know how soon you want this to be done. Best regards. Now, hopefully over time, Floyd gets converted to being an email client, not always having to talk uh, to me. All right, so we have lots of habits here. 2000 hour rule. Um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. 
once you've done something for 10,000 hours and you like doing it, you will be a genius at it. You will be very, very good at it. So, you know, you see the trapeze artist, you see the juggler, you see the ventriloquist, you see the comedian, you see the musician. What makes them so good that they can do that and you can't? And the answer is 10,000 hours. So just be mindful of this. And I tell the young lawyers and the, and the, uh, the new surgeons, I should say the new lawyers and the new surgeons, because a lot of the new lawyers are old lawyers. If you put in 3,000 hours a year, you'll get your 10,000 hours in in three and a third years. If you put in only 1,500 hours a year, it's going to take you seven years to get to the 10,000 hours. So putting in the extra hours those first few years can be a very important investment. And if you're a Beatle fan like I am, and I'm really enjoying watching these get back recordings, uh, they took 65 hours of video of the Beatles rehearsing and recording for the uh, Let It Be album, the rooftop concert and what became the Abbey Road album. And, and you see how much time they spent and how patient they were and how methodical they were. Now, they only had a six year run. Think about this. They wrote Love Me Do, their first hit song that they wrote in 1963 and finished the Let It Be album in 1969. They did all that in six years, but they were together from 1959. And from 59 to 63, they couldn't get anyone's attention. They were turned down by everyone. In fact, in 63, the one record contract they got was the fourth they had tried for. They had three turn down letters. But they and the Rolling Stones had the 10,000 hours done first. Because remember, they went to Hamburg, and in Hamburg, they played nine to 10 hours a day. So they had the 10 out, 10,000 hours in first. So when the world decided, yeah, we like this kind of music, they knew how to write it. They knew how to record it. And they had a lot of competition after the other bands had their 10,000 hours in. So be patient with people. You're, you're not just a genius when you started something. You or 10,000 hours in. Don't forget to use your subconscious mind. I think people have just forgotten about the subconscious mind. A lot of times people in my office will say, what are we gonna do on this file? Uh, what are you doing on this? What's the answer to this? And my response is, ask me tomorrow. And couple of people thought that was really rude, that I say, ask me tomorrow. But the reason I do it is when they ask me tomorrow, I often have the answer. And where does it come from? I believe it comes from my subconscious mind. Sometime during the day or in the shower or while I'm dreaming at night, the answer comes. So your sleep time, when you wake up, make your to-do list or make your to-do list before you go to sleep. If you make your to-do list before you go to sleep, then you won't have to wake yourself up at four in the morning and say, got to call Fred, got to call Fred, forgot to call Fred. Nope. Once your mind knows that you wrote it on your to-do list, it won't have to remind you of that. But if, you're rem if your to-do list says, figure out the Lowry problem. Well, then your mind will work on figuring out the Lowry problem. So that subconscious mind is in there, along with your inner child who needs to be entertained. So joke around and have some fun. Now, lawyers, CPAs, 
and other financial and other advisors. What do you say about the client who doesn't know when to quit? You know, what is it Tony Robbins says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? So one of the things that Marty Schweitzer used to tell clients, and he had very, very long client conferences, and I learned a lot from those very long client conferences, is he would say, you know, you got to know when to fold them. This thing is not looking good. Yeah, maybe you're just around the corner, but could you bring in a joint venture partner or let's just get this thing done? It, it's a loser. Fold them. You got to know when to fold them. So, you know, listen to that song, know when to hold them, know when to fold them. And when it's time to fold them, when it's getting in the way of your top 5% and it's taking time, money, and frustration, give it away to somebody else, delegate it, know when to fold it. Now, this is something I got from reading the Gallup poll books. The Gallup poll books on business are really remarkable because they don't take truth based on logic and they don't take truth based on principles and books. They run polls and they ask people questions and they find out what makes people tick. And one of those books is Know Your Strengths. I think it's by Buckingham and it comes with a questionnaire and helps you know your strengths. But one of the things that really struck me is that you get the helpers high. I mean, we're all, as human beings, looking for dopamine hits. Finish a job, put a check mark down on my to-do list, dopamine hit. I make someone laugh at my joke, dopamine hit. Have a really good month financially, dopamine hit. So when I get that interruptive phone call, that's really gonna be, for a lot of people, an, inter an irritation. I say, hey, they really need me, helpers high. And it feels good to get the helpers high. So nourish your helpers high. It feels really good to make someone feel good. When I'm on a phone call, can I compliment? You know, one thing I saw on the Get Back tracks, the Beatles, they never, ever complimented each other, ever. Read that, but I didn't realize it. But having watched about seven hours of it now, there's not a single time they go, wow, you really got that right. That's a great idea. They would just methodically work together tactfully and they would adopt and accept help from each other, but not really, there was no cheerleader. There was not much cheerleading. You, I could only imagine what they could have done if they had stuck together another three years because they were complimenting each other and uh, getting the helpers high from that. So just an idea. Okay, I want to close. I'll close here because I wanted to finish this in, in 30 minutes. And I would say about 85% of the people who started are still on. So I really appreciate that. But I want to talk about the uh, the tough luck, bad results conversations that you can have with yourself and with clients. Because as lawyers, clients come to us with insurmountable problems. And you know, if you're a member of the human race and you are trying hard, and you are generally successful, you will have problems. So that reptile brain, or whatever you want to call it, will always take that problem and cause it to be irrational to some extent and to be worrisome. Now, what's the reptile brain trying to do? Reptile brain, I believe, was designed to just get your attention. This is a problem. Work out it. Don't let it go. Get it resolved. That saber toothed tiger is going to eat your child. Get out of the fields and get this resolved. Well, now it's, well, 
there was a car accident. We don't think it was our fault. It really was someone else's fault. We're not sure if it was our car. It was an independent contractor. We think we have insurance. We're not bad. We're not sure how badly the person is hurt. We're waiting to see what will happen. And I haven't slept in two weeks. I worry about it incessantly. So I came to see you so that you could help me with my creditor protection. Okay, well, what does Dale Carnegie recommend for this? Number one, get all the facts. Take copious notes, get all the facts from the client. The client has not even taken a good look at the problem because they're so emotional and disturbed by it. They don't really understand how important all the facts are, or they feel better having told you the situation. Then come up every viable alternative. Now, one viable alternative is going to be to ask someone else. And you should always say, you know, I'm just telling you what I know. I work a lot with some other people who are brilliant, and there may be other solutions. But there's three or four solutions here. One solution is do nothing. Let's wait and see what happens. Another solution is let's hire a traffic reconstructionist to go out there while the tread marks are still out there. Yes, your insurance company did a traffic reconstruction study, but it might not have been good enough. Third, let's hire the best four lawyers in town, get their ideas before the other side hires these four lawyers, and then you got them working against you. Next, make a claim with your insurance. Every possible solution, write it down. And then you have saved your client having to write an essay exam. The exam is now multiple choice. What are they going to do? And so much of the angst and anxiety is caused by the brain saying, solve the problem of the saber-toothed tiger. Solve the problem. I will torture you until you solve the problem. So what's next? The choice is made. Client decides what to do and now launches into action. Once the client launches into action, they feel much better. And they will say, I feel so much better. Because I, I don't know why I feel better, but I know now what I'm going to do. And the activity that I'm going to do will push out that negative chatter of the fear of the problem. The next part of this, which you do as part of this consultation, is you go through what's the worst thing that can happen here? I mean, really, what's the worst thing that can happen? It turns out to be a $20 million car accident. It's your responsibility. The car was in your medical practice. Your insurance is not going to cover it. Here's what's going to happen. If all this happens and the plaintiff doesn't settle and it goes to trial, then in two and a half to three years, we're going to have to put your medical practice into bankruptcy and we'll value it. And then we will ask the bankruptcy court to sell you the medical practice for the value of the practice, which is not going to be more than three to four hundred thousand dollars because you don't really because you don't you know you don't have a contract with your practice so then three or four hundred thousand dollars is going to go to the plaintiff and then you're going to have a new medical practice and under section 360 um, so section 363 of the bankruptcy code the creditor goes away there's nothing more they can do and if we ex if we go to the plaintiff lawyer after he gets the verdict and we explain this he'll probably accept three hundred thousand cash so worst case scenario here is the insurance company is going to pay your defense costs. You're going to go to a jury trial, and then you're going to pay three to five hundred thousand dollars. Now your net worth is ten million dollars. You make a million dollars a year. How worried are you? Well, she's a lot less worried now. 
than than she was. Let's say it's a million dollar problem. What's your net worth? Six million. It's a million dollar problem at most. That leaves you a net of five million. Let me ask you, when you were in high school, did you ever think you would be worth five million? No, I never thought I'd be worth a million. Can you retire on five million? Yeah. Okay, so here's the question. Are you gonna let the worst case scenario of a million ruin your life for the next two and a half years? Can you decide not to? Yeah, I decide not to. Okay, well, maybe see a counselor. Maybe you feel better now. Um, but page 175, actually, I'm missing a page. Live in daytight compartments. What can you do? Will the problem hit you today? No. The trial's in a year. What can you do about the problem today? Nothing. I've done everything possible. Okay? Problem's not going to hit you today. There's nothing you can do about it today. Are you going to worry about it today? And if they read that book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie, and they read the chapter on live your life in daytime compartments, because that's probably what we were designed to do, they can feel a lot better about the, uh, the situation. I'll close here with some food for thought. And I, I wrote an article for the ABA. It was a uh, one hour talk over at Stetson Law School for the Business Law Society, which I called the five client commandments. And then one of the uh, attendees wrote it into an article. She and I co-wrote it for an, ar an article on the, for the ABA. If you want a copy of it, I'm glad to send it. And uh, she took my talk and made it into the five commandments which was really good delegation on my part. I, she was really bright. She was working for me. I said, you heard the speech, just make it into a great article. And the next thing I do, she paraphrased what I did from a transcript, which we got from artificial intelligence. And then she made this PowerPoint. Number one, choose your clients and your customers and your employees carefully. You can't please everyone, so you have to please yourself. Our ratio, in our practice is that 60% of the people who need our services and can afford our services will turn out to be good clients. 40% will not turn out to be good clients. They are rude or they are overly conscientious about money or they have advisors who control them in the wrong ways or they can't get their stuff together. So we've learned over the years how to identify the 60 and politely not hire or get hired by the 40. Now on the employee side, we know that only one in 10 could stand to work for our office because we are a very, very difficult place to work because there's so many things to learn because we do so many things systematically. So we've learned how to identify those 10% by using psychological profile tests, usually basically the Omnia profile test. And number two is connect with your client. And this is one where the new surgeons and the new lawyers don't understand what a connection means, what a relationship means, even if it's a phone call. Does the lawyer care? Is the lawyer my friend? Did the lawyer explain what's going on? Is this someone I can like? Is this someone I will enjoy working with? For me, as a lawyer, it's about my lifestyle. I want my clients to be my friends. I want them to be clear communicators to the extent possible. I want to be good listeners. So I want to have the connection. Number three, I want to make sure I'm explaining. You know, people are visual or they're auditory or they're kinetic. I want to know which they are. I want to make sure they understand what I'm doing so that I can be a good mentor, a good teacher of what I know. Number four, I want to know how my client thinks. 
I know how my typical client thinks. I know at the end of a call what I need to put in a letter. I think I know after 37 years, I know what they're gonna forget about and I know what's gonna confuse them. And I know what, what I didn't mention during the call because I didn't wanna confuse them or cause them anxiety or overcomplicate it. I told them the three main things, but I didn't tell them the fourth thing. That goes in the letter where they can digest it. I had a feel for what they understood, but I also have a feel for what they didn't really understood but they told me they understood it. So I want to know my client. So when my younger partners call me and go, Mrs. Jones is on the phone. She's concerned. She's confused. No, she's not. That's just how Mrs. Jones is. Just talk to her a little bit and she'll explain the whole thing to you. Just show her your, you'll care. She always blows steam. She likes to talk about the bill, but she always pays the bill. Whereas other clients, those topics mean different things. So get to know your client. And number five, unfortunately for all of us, cover your behind. What I tell the, the surgeons and the lawyers is just spend one magic minute, one magic minute thinking what can go wrong here. What's the most likely thing to go wrong and get it covered in writing. Well, it's a beautiful trust, but if you don't put your assets in it, you're going to go through probate. It's a beautiful document. But as I explained to you, I strongly recommend that you put in a disability clause and that you have a way to fire this person. You're going into a 5149 and you're 49. As I discussed, that's a very risky thing. I don't think your insurance is enough. It's not enough to say that. It's got to be put in writing. Two reasons. The first reason is it's the right thing to do. The client doesn't listen. She's reckless, but maybe she'll read a letter, maybe a copy of the letter to her CPA. But the self serving reason for the surgeon and for the young lawyer is the human tendency to blame. There is a human tendency to blame. And who's going to get blamed? Well, you may. So it's nice to have that letter that says, I am so sorry to hear about that car accident. I am so sorry to hear that that car was in the company. I am so sorry to hear that you only had 500,000 of liability insurance. By the way, here's the letter I wrote you six years ago about that. You might want to go ahead and follow these instructions now. So hopefully what I've given you today is food for thought on ways that you can improve your personal productivity, the productivity of other people in your company or firm, how you evaluate potential customers or clients, how you communicate with com potential customers or clients, and how you have a fantastic time doing all of that. So let me, let me get some feedback here for the six of you who are still awake. Actually, 137. So I am improved. I am very, very impressed and, and appreciative of that. Okay, Karen, what tape recorder do I use? I don't know. It's on Amazon for about $65, and then they can download it and listen to it. A lot of them use their phones, but I like to go ahead and give them that separate recorder. It shows how much I care. But I, Karen, if you just send me an email with the word recorder, I'll give you all the information. Okay, Michael, it was not Tony Robbins. The insanity quote was Rita Mae Brown, a feminist author. Perfect. I really like Tony Robbins because he summarizes what everyone said. Um, can you send a copy of Don't Forget the Five Commandments to Michael? Yes, I will. Um, let me see here. Okay, I think that's it. So I think the rest of you fell asleep. So let's see, let's do a shameless self-promotion here of what I'm gonna cover because I need questions. So uh, I also need to remember how to get to page one. I think I go one, return, nope, that didn't do it. But anyway, I need questions because in two weeks, the topic is answering estate and gift tax questions. And it will take me a long time 
to answer all of those questions if you don't send them to me. In addition, just to give you a preview of what we're going to do, here we go. Don't forget the saying, by the way, early to bed, early to rise, work like heck, and advertise. Uh, next week, Mathematics of Estate Planning with Professor Jerry Hash, pure genius. Then February 5th, estate planning techniques that we helped to invent or popularize. It includes the joint exempt step up trust, the self canceling installment note trust called a, a scrat, the teapot trust for IRA uh, planning, uh, estate view software, and even more. Then on the 12th, I'm going to answer questions uh, in, in question answers, probably. And then on the 13th, we're going to focus on qualified personal residence trust and S corporation planning. If you have a favorite speaker or you would like to give a little talk at one o'clock following one of these talks, we're going to start doing that and uh, looking forward to it very much. I hope that you improve a relationship today. I hope that you listen to somebody today that you haven't been listening to, and I hope that you start on the 10,000 hours of something that you would enjoy being a genius at. Thank you very much, and again, a lot of fun today. He really doesn't do a good job, but it was fun. Thank you.